You know, um, I am going to be sharing about Palm Sunday, but I want to take a moment and talk about the day before. Because the day before was a preparation. Everybody say preparation. That, that wasn't really strong. That wasn't everybody. Everybody say preparation. preparation. You know, I do a little remodeling from time to time. I'm one of those bivocational kind of pastors. I, I have different kinds of things that I get involved in from time to time, especially in building. I just, I, there's something about it that I sort of enjoy. This week we're doing this job and in, uh, in a pretty fancy area of Houston. I won't mention all of that, but it's high dollar area. And we're doing this job. And I'm going up and I'm looking at the painting of the job. And I've got my, my phone via camera with me. And I'm taking these pictures. And I'm taking these pictures because even though the finish is on the product, the preparation wasn't right. And all the blemishes in the foundation are showing up in the final product. Now, I said that for a reason, Pastor Didi. I said that because if you don't start right, you won't end right. And there are many people that try to jump into their spirituality but yet they don't get the basis, the foundation, the most important thing, right. And so as time moves along, and we think we've got the finishing touch on it, these blemishes all begin to show up. And it's so important that the preparation is right. And, and I want to read you about the preparation before... Passion Week began the day before. Can I do that? And then I'm going to jump into the day. The special day. So John 12 says this, And then six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead, was there they made him a supper and Martha served and now, now it, it makes sense right if you've been if you've been raised from the dead and the guy that raised you from the dead comes into town how many know you're going to have a dinner <laughs> I mean, I, I want you to get in the text for a moment. I mean, there's something to celebrate, right? And the guy, the main guy, he's coming to town, and, and there's this opportunity right now to honor him. So they're making themselves a dinner. I bet it's a good one. So they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Wow, what a scene. I was dead, but yet now I'm alive. I'm at the table eating with you. When we met last, I was eating dust inside a tomb. But now I'm eating a meal in your presence. Come on, think about this. Get in the narrative. Look at this. Then Mary... She took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. Now, it's been said, commentarians tell us that that oil that she anointed Jesus with was it not, it was very expensive. It was worth a year's wages. An entire year's wages. And she poured it out on Jesus. What did I say? We're talking about the foundation. We're talking about the preparation. We're talking about the beginning. Before we start our journey, before anything else, we have to have something established in our heart that's bedrock. Just to say it in a word, I'm talking about thankfulness. I'm talking about the attitude of gratitude, of, of worship. And that worship was expressed 
by the pouring out of all that she had, a year's worth of wages. Y'all remember Judas didn't like it so much. He was the treasurer. No, no offense, James. He, <laughs> We're not, we're not claiming that on James in any way, right? right. But, but, but Judas was a guy, and he was concerned about the money. Yeah, we know what kind of concern he had. He had an undue concern about the money, and so correction had to come. But listen what it says. I love how it says, and the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. I don't know if you've discovered this in the New Testament, but the Bible says that we are the dispensaries, those of us who have been born again from above, that we are the dispensers of the fragrance of God in every place. If our connectivity is to Him, He's perfumed our life in such a way that wherever we go, we carry a God atmosphere with us. That's why I can't get too excited about these believers that are all in fear and everything about what's going on in the world right now because if they had known in whom they have believed, they would be fully persuaded that He's able and that He has created them to be the thermostat, not the thermometer. There are plenty of people that can read the room. (laughs) But who's going to bring His life into the room? And as this is saying, look at this. One of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, he said, why is this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and and given to the poor? Tried Tried to spiritualize his concern. And then he said, not that he cared for the poor, he said that, but because he was a thief and he was in charge of the money box and He was used to taking what was put in it. Oh, It's my hope, guys, this morning that what is destined for God to be poured out on Him, to be perfuming Him, we do not take and use it on ourselves. Do you understand? You can take your gratitude, your thankfulness, your character, and you could pour it on yourself instead of pouring it on Him. And when we have this occasion to come together in this place, and we have the opportunity to pour our love out on Him, to pour our care out on Him, oh, please, don't shrink back from that purpose, from that gift. Jesus answered and said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day. Everybody say, kept this for the day. And the reason I want you to emphasize for a moment about the day is that there are several days that are spoken of in this area of Scripture. We're going to get to another day in a moment, but he's talking about that day for his burial and look at this the poor you're always going to have with you but me you're not always going to have while there is a balancing scripture right there we are commissioned that true and pure religion is to care for widows and orphans and for the poor and to care for them but if that's not balanced with our worship unto God it comes to nothing There's a lot of do-gooders in the world that do good for people that are in pain. And there's a new narrative that's trying to be written all around the entire globe about those kinds of things. But let me tell you, if you don't start right, you don't end right. And we have to start at the place of worship. We have to start at the place of thankfulness. The day before the Villa de la Rosa began, the day before the Passion Week began, there was a preparation for what was to come. Everybody with me? Okay, that was the appetizer. I I, want to get into a few moments for the message that I want to share with you today. By the way, you notice a number of us are wearing these resurrection (laughs) t-shirts. We're 
we're, we're, we're advertising. I've never done this before because I've always been concerned about things being a little gimmicky, you know. But we actually got resurrection mugs that we're going to give out next week to those that are visiting with us that you bring, hallelujah, to commemorate <laughs> this day, the resurrection day. I got three yes. I like the shirt. You like the shirt? Hey, by the way, do we have the full graphic that uh, Kara put together? Is I don't know if that's possible to get up there, but it's great. Wait a minute. My, my little guy's not. Why is it doing this? Okay. Well, hallelujah. Is it there? Isn't that awesome? So beautiful. I tell you, Kara, let's give Kara a hand clap offering. She does all the graphic arts. You could give her and Andrew another offering because Kara has a new last name. <laughs> and I've seen somebody else in here with a new last name, but I'm not going to mention them right now. I don't want to embarrass, of course. I never do anything like that. Never. <laughs> You know, it's an interesting thing that takes place in this scripture because as you look at this, as you continue to develop this story, we're going to stay right here with John. And we're going to go to verse 9, and I want you to look at it. It says, A great a many number of the Jews who knew he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also because of the account of many of them of the Jews that went away and believed in Jesus. Do you know, do you know the enemy is always going to try to have people that are going to want to discredit the testimony? There's always going to be the naysayers, always going to be the people that are going to go. In fact, even some of the message that I'm going to give to you today, I'm going to get in a little bit into some numbers. You could get a little lost in the weeds, but I'm, I'm hoping that I can break it down and make it simple enough that you can follow it easily. But what I want to say to you, just going on from the beginning here, there's always going to be those that are going to want to silence, modify, call some sort of desertion of things that get put down on testimony because the scripture is very clear that there's a way that we as believers overcome we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our oh man that was only about 30 percent of you who has a testimony in the house right now come on i want to know if you've been born again if you've been saved sanctified holy ghost filled water baptized you've got a testimony They wanted to silence the testimony of Lazarus. So what happens? The next day, that's the day after the day of preparation that I just talked about. The next day, a great multitude, every, everything, this crowd keeps growing. It starts out as a large group, then a great, and then now it's a great multitude. A great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him and they cried, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Wow. Could you just say that with me? Can we just all say it together? Just that phrase for just a moment. I, I, I want to hear It's so powerful. Let's say it together. Ready? One, two, three. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. I wanted to emphasize the King of Israel because we've been in this teaching series about the unshakable kingdom and the unchanging king. 
And this is a time when there's this revelation that gets connected with a prophetic proclamation of Zechariah and Daniel. And they all get intertwined together. And here they're proclaiming the kingship of Jesus. Stay with this story for just a moment because this is a very interesting word, this word Hosanna. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of what the derivative of it is in the Hebraic language, of what it literally means in the Hebrew. It's in an an imperative perfect tense, and what it literally means is save now. Hosanna means save now. You, You hear what they're proclaiming? They are declaring right now, save now. Now, depending on what your context is, will determine what it is you're wanting to be saved from. And more likely than not, most of them, even as they're saying Hosanna, they're they're contextualizing it of being saved from an oppressive governmental system instead of uh, recognizing that what they're declaring is something far greater than that. It's about an eternal reference about wholeness, about salvation coming and coming in completeness now. Can everyone just say, save Save. now. For some of you that are in this room this morning, that may be a proclamation you really need over your heart. You may not have yet come to know him who gave his life for you. We'll be celebrating next week in resurrection so that you could walk in the fullness of life, the newness of life. You may not recognize that, but I pray that as you said, save now, that the Holy Spirit takes that and germinates it in such a powerful way in your heart and with your intent that there's a spiritual revelation and a transformation that begins to take place. As I look at this verse, I know it has a point of reference. In fact, if you look in the New King James Version of the Bible to Psalms 118, 25 through 26, you'll find that this proclamation that's being said by this crowd, many of which are not believers, they're just a crowd of people that are gathered up in the moment. This proclamation was prophesied. Many, many, many years before, hundreds of years before, it was prophesied that this would be said on this day. I find that intriguing and and incredibly amazing and also compelling. The Word declares this in Psalms 118, 25. It says in the New King James, Save now, because it's the word Hosanna, (laughs) <laughs> in, the, in the Hebrew, it's the word Hosanna. It says, save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Wow. That's pretty incredible, don't you think? That God, Father Almighty, many, many years before prophesied through this writer that there was going to be a people that was going to proclaim the saving now of God's people. I don't know if that intrigues you at all or or brings you into anything in particular. It it kind of does for me because it's interesting that the verse before that has some power to it as well. Can I read the verse before? I'm going to, whether I don't know why I say can I. You know, it's just something preachers do. I mean, it it was can I. We're not really asking permission. (laughs) We're just being polite. But anyway, it says Psalms 118 says this in verse 24. It says, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, wait wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to come down. I want to come down and say something to you right now. Now, I know we sing that song all the time. I even brought it out of the archives last week. 
and threw the whole worship band off. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. You know, and we sing that with an application of saying any day that the Lord is made is this is the day the Lord is made. But that's not the way it is in the context. It's not talking about any old day. It's not talking about just any time that this is the day. I mean, it's okay to say this is the day because it's okay, but you need to understand in the Scripture, it's talking about a particular day. It's talking about a special day. It's talking about the day whenever the people proclaim, save now. I I mean, I said I was going to get you mixed up in some numbers for a few minutes, uh, but if if you'll permit me, again, there's that preacher thing. Um, I want to take a few moments and talk about this special day. And I want to talk about how it was not just any other day. Daniel, in chapter 9, in verse 25, he spoke about this day. Daniel, in 530 B.C., 530 B.C., Daniel said, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, and the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Now, you might say, okay, well, how does that all correlate? Well, it correlates because Daniel is prophesying of the building up of the temple of Jerusalem. And as he's declaring about the rebuilding of the temple of Jerusalem, and Nehemiah got a hold of that prophecy and brought it to pass. In fact, when Sir and Colton first came here, they're here with us this morning. Bless the Lord for them. Well, when they first came here, the, the anointing God came and brought to us as we were seeing God build out Kingdom City. There was a particular dimension of Scripture where he told us to go to Nehemiah and to begin to discuss, to discover, and to decree what was said over Nehemiah's house and the building of the house being laid in waste. Because this place had been laying in waste for 25 years or so. Most of this had not been built. Most of what you're sitting in right now is only about three years old or less. But there was a time where the purposes of God met the, (laughs) met the what? Met the timing of God. And when that timing and purpose came, boom, there was a suddenly and God began to build. And you all right now are sitting in the, in, in the if you will, the, the modern day application of that suddenly in God. But this day is a far more important day than even that day. Because this day that is being proclaimed was prophesied not only by Daniel and, and lived out by Nehemiah, but by also Zechariah. You see in Nehemiah 2.1, When the verse says this, it says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan. And any time they give the month without the day, it's the first day of the month. The the month of Nisan, the 20th day of King Exesaurus. I didn't say that right. I'll get it right on the fourth time maybe. When wine was before him, and I took the wine and gave it to the king, now I had never been sad in his presence before. Nehemiah comes in because he's all upset because things are not going well in Jerusalem. The walls are down. Everything's bad. His people are dispersed. He's, He's in angst and anxiety. Why am I going into all of this? Because I want you to know the forensics of what took place on Palm Sunday has its basis in prophetic revelation that goes all the way back hundreds and hundreds of years before. So if there's any doubt in your heart that our God is the great divine architect of events and of situations, you should be able to see it from this little snapshot in this particular situation. 
Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me and governors of regions in the river that they will permit me to pass through and till I come to Judah and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. You know, I could read on and on, but the, the, bottom, the bottom line is it pleased the king. And the king gave him special orders. And he said, now take these orders and I want you to go rebuild the temple. Why is this important? Because based on that fact, not only was there seven years of sevens, but then there were an additional 65 years of sevens that were added on to that that was proclaiming the day that was this is the day. The day that we're celebrating today. This very day. Stay with me just another moment and I'll get through the numbers and I'll be close to being done. Everybody good? Hopefully you that are watching by live stream are still with us and you're still alive. If not, we proclaim your resurrection life now. Amen. Nehemiah 7, 9 says, Now Daniel says from the issue of that decree until the ruler of the anointed one. Guess who the anointed one was? Jesus. There shall be seven, seven-year periods, which are 49 years, and then Jerusalem is built. Then there's 62 seven-year periods added to it. 434 years added to 49 years equals 483 years. And in the Hebrew calendar, there's only 360 days, not 365 like ours. So if you take the 360 and multiply it to the 483 years, you get 173,880 days. Days, which takes you, if you were to go and do the math through, to March 5th, 444 BC, when Artaxerxes gave the decree and added to it the 100 and, 173,880 days you get exactly March the 30th, 33 AD, which is Palm Sunday. Now, that was a whole bunch of numbers, a whole bunch of garbage goop. Most of you probably didn't get it. I get excited about those little details, so since I get excited about it, I get to throw it out to you. So, irrespective of anything else, just know this. God proclaimed a day to the day, to the moment, and he said, This is the beginning of the week of passion for my son to come to the full proclamation. What you need to get in this prophetic window, and what I want to say to you right now, is God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there is prophetic proclamations that God has brought, not only about His first return, or His first coming, but about His second coming. That's why I said a while ago in our worship time, hey, I'm not going to get worried. I hope you guys don't get worried. We know somebody that's in charge of this whole thing, and he's got it down to the final moment. Every bit of it, he's got it down, right down to the nth degree. So the first thing that was said in this in this day of the Lord, Palm Sunday, was saved now. Would you say it again to me? Saved now? But there was another thing that was said. In John 12, 14, 16, and this is where I'll be putting a bow in this, landing the plane, tying it, come to the end. Then Jesus, when he found a young donkey, he sat on it as it is written, Fear not. Say that for me. You know, it's said over 360 times in one derivative or another throughout the Scripture. Fear not. Why? Because Jesus knows, God knows, that the enemy is constantly in this word, world trying to disseminate fear onto everyone that will hear what he has to say. But God says... Fear not. Listen to this. Daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. 
and his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that were written about him. In other words, they weren't thinking about what Zechariah was saying and what Daniel was saying. And Jeremiah was, they weren't thinking about those things. But whenever the fullness came and they looked back, they went, ah, oh, that's what he was talking about. In fact, not only did they look back and say, ah, oh, that's what he was talking about. It was also, ah, oh, that's what I was a part of. Friends, I want you to hear me right now very clearly. You're a part of something. You're a part of the culmination of God's prophetic timetable as it is continuing to just march through and maturate through this world, this present system. And as it continues to move through, we're getting to be a part of that end-time revival, that end-time company of people that are proclaiming the goodness of the Lord, are proclaiming, save now, fear not, save now, fear not. I need you to, to clearly understand that that's what we have been enjoined to. That's what we've been made a part of. Whoo, a beautiful company. This 360 times the Bible speaks to us positively on the command. And instead of saying, fear not, can I put it in contemporary uh, language for a moment? I mean, fear not is powerful because, you know, God's not given us the spirit of fear but of love. Power and a sound mind, I get it. But here's another way to say it. I wrote it down here. A positive command of fear not is chill out. <laughs> Look at your neighbor right now and just tell them, chill out. <laughs> if that's a little too contemporary for you, try this one. How about to your other neighbor and just say, Relax. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe you could even look at it this way. Maybe you could just see it like this. It could be God saying, I got this. Why don't you look at your neighbor right now and say, he's got this. He's got this. Fear not. Chill out. Enter into the rest that was prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Let the faith of the living God overcome and overtake you and move you into the place of fullness in Him. So when Zechariah says, 9-9, nine, nine, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just, and he is just, and he's having salvation. He's lowly riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the fowl of a donkey. You know, even to the day, the Bible says over in Matthew, it says that they ran over. Jesus said, hey, there's going to be a donkey, a colt, a thing. You, you go over and get it and just tell them, if anybody asks you anything, just tell them the Lord has need of it. And they pick up the donkey and the fowl, which is basically the little donkey. It's the colt. It's the little guy. And Jesus gets on the little guy. I've only seen one portrayal of this, uh, you know, visually, what I think gets it close to right, where Jesus is riding on the fowl and his feet are actually dragging on the ground because he's come so lowly. You see, he didn't come on a high horse. You ever wonder where we got the expression, get off your high horse? <laughs> It's because the military people, when they would go in, you know, the captains always rode on a, a horse that was a couple of hands bigger than all the other horses. And the king would even get a hand or two above that because they wanted to be proud and on the high horse. But Jesus didn't come on a high horse. He came on a low colt. But when he comes back the second time, and this is where I'm ending, because I I would be doing you a disservice if I left you with the impression that he was only the lamb. That's why I want to read, uh, that's why I want us to do this song. You guys can come up now and get ready. The full team back. I would be doing a disservice to leave you with thinking he's only the lamb. I want you to hear this. I want you to hear that same God who prophesied to the absolute day, 530 years before it happened, 
at the exact time that that same God has proclaimed something to us about the day we're now walking in. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name was called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him all on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron and he himself treads the winepress with fierceness, with fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So he who came on a colt, on a foal, a donkey, he comes back on a high horse, <laughs> on a white horse. Whoo! And when he comes back, he comes to make war with the nations that rejected him and spurned his love, his sacrifice, and his suffering. I pray that's not us today. I pray we lay hold of what's been laid hold for us. That we lay hold of the goodness of God. His kindness in this moment is to lead us to a change of mind. To lead us to repentance. So that we can walk in the light as He's in the light.